Hi, this is Paul. Monday, of course, I put out a three-hour video. Um, I do lurk on the Discord sometimes, and Shelly was saying, I can't get through three hours, and I, I completely understand. Uh, so a little too long didn't read it, or too long didn't watch it for the three-hour video. The major change in the culture since the 1970s is that religiosity, as, um, as Robert Putnam has put it in his book Amazing Grace, now becomes the cultural dividing line. And one way to understand this is that you lose status in highly secular places for exhibiting usually Christian religiosity or some form, forms of religiosity in folk religion. Now, now, maybe in some places if you're wearing a hijab or you're um, wearing a saffron, Buddhists... Um, robe you um, might gain you might gain status in some places but that this has been the this has sort of become the dividing line in American culture and and I've just noticed lately that the you know we're awash in in secular often atheist longing for wisdom and and that that seems not completely unpredictable uh, Peter Bogosian just on Twitter, tweeting out um, Charlie Munger's top 10 rules for success. Now, whenever I see this, I'm always, I always pause because can you really, and this is in some ways the question, um, the question of value with respect to atheism, how do you determine value um, apart from really a religious foundation. Um, I, you know, and I, and I sort of chuckle when I see these things because I'm old enough to remember the Christian seeker movement in the 80s and 90s that birthed a lot of politics and churches that really drive the, the atheist nuts and, and some of whom fled from this movement. Um, you know, where you had Bill Hybels and Rick Warren using biblical wisdom to, to lure people in to the credibility of the Bible. And, and so in seeker churches in the 80s and 90s and early aughts and still some places in middle America today, because the changes often happen at the coasts first, um, the, the sermons are, you know, five ways the Bible can help you improve your marriage. Uh, five ways, five lessons from the Bible and how to raise your children. This, this uh, wisdom, this wisdom approach to the Bible, you know, the, the plan was that you would, you know, really have a sharp sermon and, and these, and the, you know, this is, this is also the time, kind of the heyday of Larry Crabb's and some of you won't know who Larry Crabb is. He was a Christian. He was a Christian psychologist, and where sort of Christianity and, and Christian psychology merged together to give people successful uh, tips and rules to help them have the family they've always wanted or the marriage they've always wanted, and 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 actually, in many ways, this this really set up. The conversation in Christian circles for purity culture and and sort of this this count this evangelical counterculture, but it was all about success. Now now many of the skeptics looked at this Christian mode of success and said, I, I, um, some looked at it and said that's really desirable. Usually people who were coming out of very chaotic households, others looked at it and said, boy, that looks tyrannical and stifling and like a straitjacket. And, and in some ways, what was happening in there was the, the, the working out of what Robert Putnam lays out in terms of the World War II the 50s, which is 45 to 65, the 60s, which is really 65 to 75, and then the 80s, and then the aughts, and, and just this back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Those, those who have their fill of chaos now seeking order, and those who have their fill of order now seeking chaos. And, and all of this to say that success is not a neutral term. And, and its, its neutrality is, 
is ex- it's it's lack of neutrality is exposed when again if you look at the conversation John Verveke and I had when when it gets instantiated in a living breathing human being or a family and and so wisdom you know wisdom is a very tricky thing because on one hand there's a sense of wisdom that's seeking that image and another way an element of wisdom is understanding and a capacity to evaluate that image and and to ask if that image really is finally and fully good and again the, the more you the more you dive into the depths of these questions the more and more religious the whole operation becomes so you know obviously Ryan Holiday's I I, I looked at his videos and it felt like seeker stoicism. I, I felt like in some ways I'm I'm back in in sub, suburban America in the 80s and 90s and and watching what what Rick Warren and Bill Hybels had done in Christianity and and watching this now applied to other ancient religions. I mean 30 years ago if you had told me I would be seeing, we didn't have YouTube 30 years ago, but I would be seeing people become popular, something akin to a mega church pastor, but just online, and I should talk being online myself, but something akin to a mega church pastor, a a, a lifestyle guru who was selling stoicism. Because I pretty much, I mean, I was familiar, when you'd read N.T. Wright's book, you know, he, he would say things like, you know, really, for a certain class in the Roman Empire, the two dominant competing philosophies that Christianity had to engage with were Stoicism and 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 the Epicureans. And and in some ways, boy, here we are right there again. And at peak new atheism, the mantra um, might have been whatever whatever you do, don't be religious. But the difficulty is once you take in these these secular wisdom nuggets washed of metaphysical accumulations even from the ancient world don't think that they aren't going to attract new forms of religiosity and and of course we've seen this in the new age movement but but just because someone imagines that, well, they've been through the baptism of Sam Harris, that, that, that they'll be able to av- avoid religiosity. Well, you know, look at my conversation with John Verveke about inevitable religio. Uh, religio. I mean, it, it, it cut, just keeps accumulating. Andrew Root's, I mean, the narrative in Andrew Root's The Pastor in the Secular Age is easily worth the, the price of the book because he so nicely lays out really from the time of Darwin until now the the how lost how how, how pastors themselves have become lost sheep and and I think so he he leads it off by saying he's talking about a a pastor that he met at a at a conference of course if there's anything quintessential to the seeker movements it was conferences um, at a conference and the pastor confessing to to Andrew Root that he was lost he didn't know what he was doing and this pastor he was standing in the line of an old vocational tradition of course but he nevertheless felt like he was on new ground pastors like Augustine of Hippo and Thomas Beckett and Jonathan Edwards never dealt with the fragility of meaning the flatness of our moments of passage the emptiness of the ordinary it would be as hard for them to understand um, the feeling of malaise as it would be as it would a smartphone. Now, I kind of like to see Andrew Root and and James K. A. Smith have a conversation because, of course, the premise of Smith's new book is that no, actually, Augustine would very much understand that, and Augustine sort of led the way out of it. And I think they're both making very fair points. Obviously, part of the difficulty is is to what degree can we really even imagine pouring ourselves into Augustine's world? You know, you you see in the transubstantiation transubstantiation book with with Brett Sockold how just from Aquinas to Luther, so much understanding was lost so that 
you know, Luther would have put up a dartboard and threw dart at, darts at the post picture of of, of St. Aquinas, but Brett Sockold's, and I think rather compelling argument is that L Luther was in a sense, without knowing it, trying to recapture what, what Aquinas had, did I say Aquinas, a dartboard, what Aquinas had achieved. And, and Luther, you know, maybe, you know, he was trying to approximate it with his consubstantiation and Calvin was trying to approximate it with his real presence, but the, the ground beneath their feet had shifted. So, of course, James K. A. Smith argues that, well, the same shifting sand was what Augustine was dealing with. And here Andrew Root says, no, Augustine didn't have a meaning crisis. And, and James K. Smith says Augustine was quintessentially in the midst of a meaning crisis. And, well, are we are we that sure we can travel back there with our imaginations or are our retelling and recasting of these ancient heroes just as in some ways appropriations as was done to Augustine by Calvin and Luther when they, they really couldn't even hear Aquinas fairly. So, so Andrew Root goes on and says, it's not the meaning, rites of passage, and the significance of the ordinary that have been annihilated. It was just that they have been hollowed out, repurposed for ends other than experiencing the defined. Now, first of all, let's not forget iconoclasm. That, that in fact, the rites of passage weren't simply hollowed out. Maybe they continued in the Anglican and Episcopal and Lutheran and the high church traditions, but in fact, they were set aside in the low church traditions completely. And even in Christian Reformed land where I have been, which is always sort of this middle space, um, in, in some places they were cast aside and and, and everyone grabbed at the seeker ethos while, while others have lingered and now they're being brought back in. But this comes at an interesting time when, again, it's religiosity that is the, it's Christian religiosity that is the stuff that will lose you status. And, and this is, this is chasing, experiencing the divine. And I'm increasingly skeptical about our capacity to use even a phrase like that because in a in a world where the most ontological we can get about values are feelings where we've got moral feelings and even in even in the land of critical theory where where um feeling is good enough to mount a prosecutor prosecutorial campaign against um, the injustices of history. The seekers would have very much said, well, we have the smoke machine and the big band and the big sound and the, the worship leader in skinny jeans so that you can feel the divine, so that you can experience the divine. And, and we're very quickly at, of course, Andrew Root is writing downstream from, from Charles Taylor that you know the the experiencing the divine is exactly what has what has supernovaed that well I'll experience the divine this way I'll experience the divine this way and and pretty soon they're they're back to the old saw of trying to feel the feel the elephant and and everybody's got a different piece of the elephant that they call god except of course the one who tells the story that says no it's an elephant and you all know what that means Religiosity has everything to do with performative rites, which is which is where um, um, Esther Meeks and I forget the other the the the, the prophet out of New York that's been barking up this tree. I uh, should really have a conversation with him. He basically said yes, but I want to know his work a little bit better. But where, where they're getting at that? No, it's and, and really where where Peterson was getting at because it's 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 in the performance that the well the body keeps the score as we've learned from trauma and so in some ways we we've gone from a dystopian zombies in the meaning crisis to looping virtual empty pleasures um you know a decade ago 
The Walking Dead was the, the hot TV commodity and an, an hour or two hour long shows of, of loss and agony. We were trying to um, maybe experience the divine or at least grieve the loss of the divine from, from the bottom. And, and now what we're seeing in shows like, like Upload and, and The Good Place is that, okay, now that we fully cast ourselves in the role of God, since, since God is no longer believable, now we're stuck with us being God. And I'm, I'm sort of waiting. I haven't checked if the, the good place is fully on Netflix yet because the, every season they have twists and turns and I don't want to give too many spoilers away. But you can watch just the one season of, you can watch just the one season of Upload and in, in a sense, and, and I know I saw some chatter between that, you know, the Upload guy made sure he didn't watch the, 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 the good place shows because there's some, they have some sitcom thing in the past. We've gone from any dramas of zombies to, to sitcom-y beautiful people living in the midst of their angst because you know what? They've got all this power to achieve the good, but they realize that their visions of the good are insufficient to actually deliver upon the longing in the middle of their hearts. And, and in that sense, not only have we grown skeptical about the ontology of the divine, but we've, but we've lost our capacity, we've lost our confidence in imagining what divinity would look like. And so in a sense, the pastoral illness that Andrew Root has been noting is further down the line now coming to the pastors and the priests who are filling the screens with the religious with the religious footing that that everyone is is really absorbing on Netflix and Amazon and even old school network TV now in all fairness to Sam Harris I actually made this video yesterday and only made half of it and threw it away kind of a long speech in it about my uh, every friday on the discord server the bridges of meaning discord server i'm doing a couple hours of, of chat with with the folks in the server and sam harris came up and i had to confess you know like some of the comments in some of my videos with sam harris when when i was looking at his some of his free will arguments and and not only do I see Calvinism in the in the woke culture, but there's a lot of Calvinism in Sam Harris too. And and perhaps um, someone asked me why why I read Miracles so often because I've talked about that quite a bit. C.S. Lewis's book Miracles, and and I had to confess that in many ways for many years before I had the video series where where you're all acting as um, my confessors so often in these videos. You know, I, I, I had to deal with the, the part of my head that that, um, that Sam Harris occupies. And not Sam Harris himself, because I never lived, lived, listened to much of his stuff, but the, 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 the stuff from which sp Sam Harris has sprung is in all of us. And, and I would feel myself slipping into, into materialistic nihilism and, and C.S. Lewis and miracles um, would... would reliably exercise that from me because if all there is is the is the whole show then I will slip into nihilism and and C.S. Lewis argued persuasively for me every time I'd read the book and I'd need to come back to it religiously would conv continue to be able to convince me that no this powerful story that that is suggested to you even when people don't know they're doing it, isn't quite as airtight as everyone would imagine. That that in fact, virus the viral load has a fair amount of um, 
a fair amount of dependence upon the amount of viral characters that you surround yourself with and the amount of coughing and sneezing and talking and singing that is done at you. We're susceptible to all sorts of viruses. So, but, but at the same time, I understand Sam's confusion and outrage at religiosity. Those who practice religiosity work um, beneath a, a relational assumption that is easily confused with magic. I completely understand the, the critique because, oh, you believe that, that saying a prayer will, will somehow mean you won't get COVID? Or, or saying a prayer will somehow mean that, that cancer will avoid you? Yeah, a lot of Christians talk that way. I don't think it's warranted, given the fact that their Savior is up on a cross. Or maybe that's why you go to a church where there isn't one on a cross. And, but the thing is, the cross is empty, not because he avoided it, but because he went through it. Yeah, you know, the, 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 the facile, cheap assumption that attending a, a place or performing a rite or reciting a special, powerful, or holy words can, can somehow um, um, conjure a power that physics does not see. That would never be the way I would assert that Christianity is. It relates to a power that holds physics in its hand, but that God as a friend of mine who was raised in a church that didn't believe in modern medical science and so his childhood diabetes went untreated you know well into his youth meaning that he had lifelong medical complications and died in his 40s blind nearly deaf heart problems all the way around you know brandon spent some time in church here with me you know he said well my god kills grandmas and puppies every day he said that with a lot of credibility and when he actually was home alone and felt himself dying took a marker and wrote do not resuscitate on his chest just so nobody could shock him back into this world he wasn't looking for an upload at least not from the horizon corporation with all of their in-app purchases and i completely understand the need of ringing the jesus smuggling out in order to get your science right and i think jordan peterson said it well i mean you sort of say okay i'm i'm not going to look through this eye when i try to do science and it's perfectly legitimate to cover one eye when you're taking an eye exam or you're trying to figure something out and you're applying your pro, you're you're attempting to apply the spirit of geometry to something that that perhaps will yield itself to that and and in fact of course the the originators of modern science were deeply Christian men who, who believed that God would not fool them, but that God would reveal himself to those who asked and to those who sought. And, and that's probably the best, one of the best parts of, of that conversation between Eric Weinstein and Ross Douthat. Um, There's no gab for your God, sir. And, and Eric, in all honesty, noting that when it comes to applying this, when it comes to applying this, the scientists just as readily hide their gaps as the as the as the carnival preacher make sure that only those who can be healed make it up to the stage and pay no attention to all of those who who have prayed the prayer but continue to walk on crutches back to a home filled with pain. Only after we exercise the rights can we get down to the business using physics to get what we want, but right in there is the key that science doesn't tell us anything. People who are looking at science are telling us something. And the manifest image itself is never exercised from the application of any science you might find. 
And then, of course, along comes Jordan Peterson and his his five part video on the death and resurrection of Christ from 2018 is back up on his YouTube channel, which is a good thing because, you know, when I listen to him, because Jordan of course takes these two worlds and, and is trying to put them back together again. That's a really hard thing. And, and in many ways, Jordan's biblical series was, was, was a sign of trying to put those two worlds back together again. And, and one of the observations that Jordan made in this video was that, well, sacrifices work. And, and of course, that's what makes Sam Harris terribly nervous. And then Sam says, yeah, but understand something, that science is wielded by people. And, and when you bargain with the future, you're bargaining with people. That, that that the two eyes are not separated by a blinder, but they're both right here and the same neck and the same head are moving the, the vision of science and the manifest of Im image both at the same time. And, and the more power we take with, with covering one eye, the more power human beings have. And so you're not going to pull these things, the, the pulling these things apart was already, it was always just a, a tactical move but any application of it puts it together and so that's why jordan comes together and and and, and crosses the streams and makes and makes believers that we actually can drive this way into skeptics with that have to pay very high auto insurance rates and and i've noticed that 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 you know, Jordan was in, in a sense a harbinger. Even even Scott Adams, who is, you know, I read Scott Adams' book on success after the Trump campaign because I, like many, you know, Scott called it right, and and so I haven't been following Scott closely lately, but he's he's a very intriguing figure, and he's getting even more interesting. And a viewer sent me this video where where. You can read and you can, I can, you know, I had plenty of clips in previous videos of, of Scott sounding like a celebrity atheist. Increasingly, he's sounding like Jordan Peterson. In, in other words, oh, you, you thought you can stop the Jordan Peterson contagion by, by, by exiling Jordan away or shouting him down or debunking him or something, but it's spreading without Jordan. And, and part of it is the simulation theory. And, and Scott Adams points to a red pill podcast of sorts in this video about the simulation theory. And, and I, could, I could feel right away when I heard the simulation theory that, yeah, this is, as somebody said, this is, um, you know, this is religion for atheists. And I think it's really theism or even polytheism for atheists. Because, of course, how many how many people are up there creating these games that are simulating the consciousness in which we work? And I, even though I've heard various takes on the simulation theory, the, the, the podcast was a, a very well put together and compelling articulation that, that Scott Adams in even though embedded in all of his skepticism, puts out there and says, well, you know, if you look at this, by all odds, we're in a simulation. And I think simulation is a, is a horrible word for it. We're someone else's computer game. And, and who knows what, what life looked like for them. And that's why I think the word simulation is a terrible name for it. Because why would they, why would they simulate us? But, but simulation is sort of what makes the argument work in sort of a, a, a subconscious level that suddenly people begin to imagine, yeah. And, and the red pill, and this is, again, sort of the continual confusion with, with Jordan P Peterson and conservatism, that he's sort of a conservative, but it's not exactly conservatism. And it's... it's 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 a new thing and it's an old thing and and maybe there's some decadence involved in terms of a return but does this make your well yeah it 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 leads people down the path to looking for not only an imaginary 
that is capable of affording hope. But rites and rituals and religiosity that can make it believable. And just today I talked to Cassidy and I'll be probably sharing her video in a day or two. And, you know, how many people exploring orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism, deeply sacramental, and, and even in my Reformed camp. And, and this, this movement started before I noticed Jordan Peterson that the church plants in the 90s that were using seeker methodology now here on the coasts have all switched to um, smells and bells and sacraments and liturgy and and even the Christian Reformed churches. And it's it's fascinating watching this migration. And of course, they're not reading Charles Taylor. They're not listening to Jordan Peterson. They're just following what? They're following, in a sense, the progression. It was Walking Dead, and now it's Good Place and Upload. Now It was angsty, dystopian, zombie apocalypse, and now it's angsty human simulations. Now, now, Scott Adams is so, so postmodern. And I know some of you will say, how is, how is, how is both the woke world and Scott Adams postmodern? Well, I'd say in some ways, Scott Adams is more postmodern than woke world. Why? Because Scott Adams even though he came into this debunking religiosity, he's learned from Donald Trump, who, and I agree with what Eric Weinstein said in his video, he's, he's a genius of performity. And, and, and how is it Donald Trump, Donald Trump's base is the, are the deplorable religiosity camp, exactly the kind of person that J.D. Vance is writing about. And so, you know the fact that some of these critters in the in the in the IDW are scary smart, like the Weinstein brothers and Jordan Peterson. Well, I'm, I'm not always I'm not always sure they fully consciously know the track they're following, but the track isn't that hard to discern for me because I know religion and religiosity. Now, 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 Scott Adams says once you realize that you have the power of filters, which is basically the frames that we've been talking with our fancy Vervakian words, um, you can design the future to your tastes. But that's exactly where that's exactly where these the good place and and upload step in, because well, what are your tastes? And if if there's anything that the good place I mean, the good place starts talking philosophy, but ends in skepticism, at least a, a skepticism in the confidence of the human imagination to deliver finally what our hearts long for. And in that sense, James K.A. Smith is dead on right that, yeah, we've wound up back with Augustine. And basically, Upload is saying, okay. You can have your fantasies if you have the money to pay for it. If you're if you're as if you're as fat as Elon Musk or 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 Peter Thiel. But but look at Elon Musk and Peter Thiel. Elon Musk, every time you get him on Joe Rogan, we're talking simulation. And Peter Thiel, he goes to a Lutheran church. So, you know. Scott Adams should be really nervous about stopping and asking himself, where do your tastes and desires come from? Because you're going to wind up either with a nihilistic meaning crisis or in the arms of some kind of religion, which will lead to religiosity. In, in some ways, Scott Adam's video reminded me a lot of of Michael of Michael and Karen when 
when I talked to them not too long ago, Michael said to Luke on the Discord server, rewatch Personality 12 of 2017. It's sort of an abridged Jordan Peterson. You've got the cognitive side, the world is too big, the a priori structure that he tried to deliver to Sam Harris, but Sam Harris didn't want to have a conversation as much as his usual debunking tour. You, you compress the world down into cartoons and stories in order to de engage them. Religion is the JPEG of being. But, but, and, and the future is full of potential. But if all we have left are human beings in order to even imagine the potential, maybe something that we can pull off virtually, maybe we'll escape the zombie utopia by going into a bunker with a nuclear reactor and, and, and servers that will keep dishing up to us the, the best utopian dreams we have. You go to upload and you realize... Either they're going to be commercial with in-app purchases or we're going to get to a point where our Im a religious imagination hits the limits of our skulls or even of our capacity to collaborate and it's all just boring and so we need to make a perpetual line of computer game after computer game after computer game and maybe it's going to be a little island on, on Nintendo Oh, oh, shoot. Nintendo, the new littlest thing. The new little thing. The little island where you have the little people. I'm watching my kids play it. Or or it's it's going to be Civ 16 so that I can continue to try to hope that the AI gets better. Because when I play against my sons and when I play against the AI, it's a completely different game. Maybe where we're, purgatory is becoming increasingly believable. Because if you look at the good place and if you look at if you look at upload, they look very much like purgatory. Because not even can the divine no longer be imagined, but but neither can some future ideal state for us. And so the celebrity athe atheists say, Ah, you're better off with the big sleep. It's divine, it's 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 eschatological suicide not merely annihilationism for those who don't make the cut. And, and we very quickly realize, which is why all the, all the good advice giving, that controlling your future means controlling yourself. And yeah, read the Stoics. It isn't easy to control oneself. When biological survival no longer forcing you into meaningful endeavors, there needs to be something outside of yourself to push you to be what you can become. But as we as we close off one eye and we gain so much power and we become the victims of our own success and we become decadent. You choose your own sacrifice, Jordan Peterson's going to say. Well, the sacrifice is so full of people. The usual acting out gets you nowhere. And you'll notice this if you pay attention, which if you look at those who are, are looking for a religion that isn't a, a religion or the, or the stoicism or, or going back to church, they're smart. They paid attention. They've realized something. And they've realized that if they're their own God, they've got a lousy God. So, so the good advice people, while there is life, there is potential for a future. So don't waste your now. But, but it kind of falls into the, okay, here you go, Scott. User interface on the reality. Now you can get what you want. But what do I want? What should I want? What happens when I keep getting what I want when I win the Super Bowl and I've already been to Disneyland three times? And they don't deliver happiness. It's the happiest place on earth, right? They don't deliver happiness as well as possible. So it's... It's it's Disney forever that I get uploaded in, or is it Horizon? If I've got it, if I've got an unlimited data package and I'm not down in the two gig room, meaning is found. Jordan will say in the pursuit, the engagement, the reaching. Well, in a sense, right away, if you think it through, well, will the city on the hill really finally fully satisfied? How will I know? But of course, in many ways, as is suggested, if you're watching Upload, what if you're in a tough spot? 
What if the government is against you? You know, just because I don't like the the wokish imagined solutions for sexism or racism or bigotry of every of every sense by no means means that I don't believe all of that stuff is real and crippling and and holding people down. And and frankly neither does Jordan. Jordan just says well, if you buy that narrative and you believe that you're a helpless victim, well, then you've got nothing because, as I say to people all over the place, if you really believe in the woke narrative, what makes you think white people are going to want to save you now just because they have a, a racist counselor? I mean, this stuff is just recycled versions of all sorts of other religions, including conservative Calvinism. And, and just because people say, I'm totally depraved, doesn't make them any less depraved doesn't make them any less a victim of, of all kinds of their epithumias if you're listening to my first draft and the things inhabiting their soul. What if you're in a tough spot? What if you don't have enough money to get uploaded to Horizon or one of the upscale future servers that, that will give you all-you-can-eat buffets and lovely sunsets to watch? Well, now we're in a virus, and do we dare end the decadence? Douth it ass in the book? Well, maybe where it's not going to be our choice. Maybe, maybe all of the belief that we had in our capacity, as Harari names it, to, to overcome pandemic and war and famine, maybe, as Eric Weinstein said, we just had a good 75-year run. You know, nobody expected the First World War either because they, they made war illegal. They tried doing that in the 20s and 30s, too. Well, let's have the League of Nations and we'll make war illegal. Yeah, good luck with that. Didn't work. We had the Second World War. So, dare to end decadence? The pandemic comes unbidden. A very predictable crisis crushes our confidence and our capacity to achieve our goals. And as, as we're seeing right now on the internet, well, maybe Sweden and herd immunity has the right idea. And then someone will say, yeah, but you don't really know that that herd immunity will come. We're just all facing a huge degree of uncertainty, so I don't be surprised when religiosity makes a comeback. Then you, you first just started thinking Stoic thoughts, but pretty quickly you're going to really hope for a Stoic shrine or a Stoic ritual, and you say, no, that's not Stoicism. Ah, uh, yeah. Look at the Buddhist shrines and the Buddhist rituals, too. Why do you think in places in the world where Buddhism has been around for a very, very long time, you're sacrificing goats to hopefully get the airplane off the ground, right? I can show you the clip. In Putnam's book, he has a chart. Let's see, did I put the graph in? There it is. I'll go back and look at it. Again and again in my videos, I've made the note that it's during the Cold War that... American religiosity, as measured in religious service attendance, peaks. And there's the chart in the 1960s, you know, hovered around 40%. And then boom, in the 50s, it takes a big step up. And then in the 60s, it starts to come down and sort of been wobbling around that 40%, kind of up and down and up and down and a little lower. And you might say, well, why? Why in the 50s, with all of our science and with all of our things, did, did it spike? Well, Robert Putnam has an idea. Let's listen to him. Since the flux is a constant, and he goes through all the, the ways that they try to measure this stuff, because you get more religious when you get older and and and. He runs through it all, so you can read it if you want to. Since flux is a constant in American religion, there is no normal period in our religious history, and certainly not the 1950s. The years after World War II witnessed an unusual surge in public religiosity, so much so that some observers classified it as another great awakening of evangelical fervor that had been punctuated American religious history helping to produce some, epo some epochal events as the American Revolution, the Abolition Movement, and the Progressive Era. That labeling of the 1950s was in re retrospect misleading, because unlike the ecstatic enthusiasms of earlier awakenings, the post-war surge was channeled primarily through conventional and even establishment institutions. 
unlike the 70s. Portending no great revolution, either civil or religious. For our story, the post-war period is important primarily as the backdrop for momentous religious changes of the ensuing half-century. The anxieties of World War II seem to have revived American interest in religion that had flagged in the 20s and 30s. No atheists in foxholes. So, yeah, if we're going to have another depression, this one pandemically induced uh, fellow pastors, don't count that it'll necessarily mean a bump in your lifestyle. No atheists in foxholes, it was said. Though elsewhere, wars had been, a, had been associated with decline of religion. World War I certainly was. In Europe. Post-war affluent social mobility and the onset of the Cold War and its attendant nuclear standoff encouraged a paradoxical mixture of optimism and anxiety and a renewed appreciation for traditional values, including both patriotism and religion. Recruit Thor to beat the godless communists. Most important, the returning veterans and their wives began producing what would soon be called the baby boom. Then, as now, getting married, settling down, raising children were associated with more regular church going. The resulting surge in religious involvement during the 1950s was truly massive, even compared to the seismic events later in the century. Figure 3.5 outlines the ups and downs of religious attendance in America over the 70 years. The level of religious attendance reported in the Gallup surveys probably exaggerated the reality, especially in recent decades, when most other service so sh surveys showed gradual decline. Virtually all experts agree, however, that the period from the late 1940s to the early 1960s was one of exceptional religious observance in America. Here's figure 5.3 if you're watching the video. The upsurge was heavily concentrated among 20-somethings. Figure 5.6 pulls together evidence from scores of Gallup surveys to illustrate that. While all generations participated in this post-war upsurge, it was especially marked among young adults in their 20s in the 1950s. In that group, weekly church attendance skyrocketed from 31% in February of 1950 to an all-time record for young adults of 51% in April of 1957. An astonishing rate of change in, 11, in seven years, implying millions of new churchgoers every year. And as we've seen in America with, this book was written in 2010, and the decline from 2010 to 2020, these ups and downs can come fast. Further analysis, this time of the National Election Studies archives, shows that the surge was somewhat greater among whites and among college-educated men. Isn't this interesting? Of white men aged 21 to 34, this is the Jordan Peterson cohort, of white men aged 21 to 34, weekly church-going rose from 28% in 1952 to 44% in 1964. Who were these unusually pious young men? Of all Americans born in the 1920s, 80% had served in the military during World War II, and after the war, many took advantage of the GI Bill to become the first college-educated persons in their families. It was the GI generation who as young husbands and fathers together with their wives led the surge to church in the late 1940s and 1950s. We saw earlier that this cohort would remain unusually observant, high religiosity, for the rest of their lives. Throughout all the shocks and aftershocks of the ensuing half century and even into the next millennium, the G.I.s and their wives and widows would form the bedrock of, an American, relig of American religious institutions and the civil institutions as well. The surge had no particular political cast. Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives were equally represented among those thronging to the pews. Rather, the distinguishing features of the young men now occupying their wives, now accompanying their wives to church, accompanying their wives to church, were that they were mostly young fathers, mostly veterans, and mostly college educated. Charles Colson. 
the post-war boom, the church going was fueled above um, was fueled above all by men who had survived the, de- the Great Depression as teenagers and World War II as grunts and were now ready at last to settle into normal life. That normality they had never known but could only dream. And that dream would become the 1950s. Normal life with a steady job. The same dream that Eric Weinstein is saying, why can't we reproduce this? Again, read George Marsden's Twilight of the American of the American Enlightenment because those 1950s were a lot more angsty which would yield the 1960s as as Marsden who is is a very competent historian lays out. So they were ready now to settle into a normal life with a steady job, a growing family, a new house and car, and respectable middle-class status. Church going was an important emblem of that respectability. Religiosity used to be an emblem by which you gained status. If you were having the three martini lunch, you bragged about the fact that You were on the board at the Episcopal Church and you were helping raise money for the new worship, it wasn't called a worship center, for the new cathedral. Look at the American Cathedral in Washington. That's, there it is, right there. Singling out the sociological center of the surge should not obscure how widespread religious engagement was during this period, visibly in nearly all segments of society. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. mobilized the black churches of the South, but religiosity among, amongst African Americans was higher then as it is higher now. That's more the constant. It was the white college-educated men that were the variability. In fact, the returning GIs were merely narrowing the gap in church attendance with women, blacks, and older Americans who had always been and remained more observant than young white men. So the GIs deserve pride of place count only on um, pride of place in our account only on the theological principle that the newly saved merit special praise. In other words, everybody had always been then, and the white men coming back from the war were the ones joining them in church, and their money, and their influence, and all of the chutzpah and organizational skills that they learned in the army were now devoted into the creation of the main line and evangelical churches that surged in that period. The most visible in, ma- in the most visible in mainline Protestant and Catholic churches, the surge was felt in all religious traditions, stretching this period against the backdrop of more than three centuries of American religious history. Um, as this is summarized, American religious communities of nearly every type, Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish churches, sects, and cults were favored through the post-war decade and a half by an increased commitment and remarkable popular desire for institutional participation. These young white men took on the high-status jobs and their money flowed into the respectable religious organizations which... Now you're anticipating where Putnam is about to go next, were exactly what was responded against by the counterculture. And we'd have a tick-tock, tick-tock of religiosity until we get to sort of the, the polarized moment that we have now. But here we have a Roman Catholic running against a prosperity gospel person Which one is known for cheating on his wives? Which one has suffered the loss of a a cherished wife and family and remarried into another one? And you would imagine, surely the Republican is the Roman Catholic and and the serial divorcee who's got a reputation for chasing Playboy tail would be the Democrat. And you'd be wrong. What's happening now? 
Should it be any wonder that we're reaching an inflection moment when, well, gosh, maybe I'll be stoic, but, 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 but my stoicism is very Protestant. It's all up here in my head, and I have to somehow find a token. Remember Inception when he's spinning the top? You need something physical that you can connect between this world and the next. I, I, I recommended to, to John Verveke in my conversation with him yesterday, Laura Hildebrand's Unbroken. Read it. Don't watch the movie. Read the book. Listen to the audio book. I remember listening. I was When I was listening to this audio book, my kids were in high school and I'd often listen to audio books kind of as a parent, driving them to school. And I'd pick audio books that I thought that they would appreciate. And Boy, it's rough. The, the, the guy goes from being stranded on a raft to, to a Japanese POW camp with the most sadistic, with the most sadistic um, Japanese warden in the war and survives it and comes back to America with all kinds of good fortune to, to marry the woman of his dreams only to realize he can't beat the bottle and he finds salvation at a Billy Graham rally. And it changes his life. A World War II story of survival, resilience, and redemption. Well, you've got to hold up Unbroken and you've got to hold up Mad Men and you've got to look at them both. Inevitable religio, it comes to us. You're 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 gonna start thinking first. I've in a very Protestant way. First, I've got to reform my brain, and then very quickly you realize no that that the things that I want are conditioned by my body. So not only do I have to freeform my brain, I need to reform my practice. The substance of the movement will be compressed and expressed in ritual. First you act it out, Jordan Peterson says in biblical series number one. And we watch ourselves acting it out. Do you think we left that stuff behind? Just because we have talking and fancy words and, and images and, and virtual realities that we can upload? No. Why do you go to Star Wars or Rocky Horror Picture Show in outfit. Why is cosplay something that you read on Twitter all the time? Religio is inevitable. Watch Nassim Talib skin in the game talk at Google. Fascinating talk. He asks him the question, if you want to write a book to survive, what do you write? Takes a few answers. You write about old technology, the Lindy effect. Old technology has a huge advantage over new technology. Why? It's Jordan Peterson argument, because it's endured. But here we are. Which divine? Is it sort of the metaphysical afterlife where we're living in a simulation, sort of, in the good place? Or is it just the simulation you're uploaded into in, in upload? Or do, you ha do you trust both in the capacity of another beyond your own and in the goodness of agents um, to do what we cannot do ourselves? Well, baby, you're knocking on the door of religion. In one of my rough drafts, I... I read one of my favorite C.S. Lewis books from The Last Battle where they discover that Narnia, the Narnia that they've been living in, that there's a true Narnia further up and further in. But it's not designed by some corporation horizon in competition with Disney for, for your upload daughter and your, your upload dollar and your in-app purchases. Moments and instances of well-being point to a more enduring well-being, Lewis says. The future well-being must be instantiated into the actual well-being, at least in terms of glimpses and moments that see through to something more permanent than us. Now, if you bite down in the simulation theory, the irony of that it's, is that it's sort of an inversion of Lewis's 
Platonism as such. We're looking for portals. We're, we're drawn to the glory. We feel the despair. And, and, and when we see the, instas, the instances and glimpses of, of a shalom and a glory that we can't grasp ourselves, we long to put it in a bottle, but no bottle we find can contain it. We lean into this trusting that the final consummation is, is a gift secured by another, something that is beyond what we can conceive of, which is both moreness and suchness. Yeah, if you're, if you're Scott Adams, you know, you can play the deep skeptic now that you've got money, you've got popularity, you've got all of this, but what happens when the doctor says you've got cancer? And yeah, we've got, we've got morphine. We can pump you full of morphine so you don't feel anything. Well, how well is, is that user interface going to work for you, Scott? I don't hope that on you, but I, I'm by plenty of ho I'm by plenty of hospital beds with people on morphine drips. I've been around. I see what this world does. 